After having some interesting discussions with athletes over the past couple of weeks, I thought I'd put this video together and I can't believe I haven't covered this on the channel already, but today we're going to talk about relative versus absolute VO2. Everything you need to know between these two numbers for VO2 max, they mean the same thing, but they're represented in two different ways. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. I know I have been a little bit quiet on the channel over the last little while for good reason. Been rehabbing my quad. If you haven't seen uh, the, the news, I, we've also gone back into a lockdown here in Melbourne as of uh, we go into one as of midnight tonight. So it has been a little bit of a chaotic last couple of weeks, but I'm going to try and get back on and get some regular content back out for you over the next little while. So please, if you are enjoying the content, have been looking back at all the other videos Click the subscribe button down below if you haven't already. Continue to support the channel by sharing these videos. Head over to Instagram as well. I post a lot about my quad rehab, my injury rehab over on NJ underscore sports science. Follow my journey across there. It's in the highlight section as well. So you can actually go and have a look at the types of sessions I was doing as part of my rehab. Also, the join button down below. If you are interested in supporting the channel above and beyond just being a subscriber, click the join button. Some interesting and some great perks that you can be uh gain access to by becoming a member of team NJ Sports Science for less than a coffee a month. You can support the channel above and beyond just being the average subscriber or average viewer here over on the channel. All right, to get into today's content, we are talking about relative versus absolute VO2 max. Now, this is an interesting thing that I thought I'd covered one of the early videos, but I went back and had a look and realized that I hadn't actually talked about this on the channel before, but I have mentioned it a few times. So you would have seen particularly if you have a Garmin watch or a similar uh, monitoring device that tells you a VO2 max, you would have seen a number like 40, 45, 50, whatever it might be. Maybe it's 60, maybe it's 70. It doesn't really matter what the number is, but you've seen this number represented as VO2 max. So if we have to understand, well, what are we talking about here? The number that you see on your watch is your relative VO2 max, which is your absolute VO2 max divided by your body weight in kilograms. Now, what does that mean when we don't know what our absolute VO2 max is? Well, our absolute is the total amount of oxygen you can take in, transport and utilize per minute just as the total number. So typically what we see here is we see bigger athletes, and when I say bigger, taller, more muscle mass, typically those types of athletes are gonna have much higher absolute VO2s than everyone else, why? because they typically have bigger lung sizes, bigger lung capacity, they have more muscle mass, bigger heart size, so they can pump more blood around the, the, the body per beat. All these factors contribute to greater oxygen consumption total, but as a byproduct of them being bigger, they have more, more mass. The difference here is that we use absolute when, we, when we're not really interested in, I guess, comparing an athlete to someone else. And the reason being is because the bigger athletes, as I mentioned, have the advantage. They have more muscle mass, they can use more oxygen compared to a smaller athlete. So when we are looking at comparing two athletes together or where body weight is a concern, we use that relative measure, as I mentioned before, absolute divided by someone's body weight in kilograms to give a, a basically a power to weight ratio. For the cyclists who are watching this, you know all about watts per kilo probably. You've heard watts per kilo, um, that, that power to weight ratio. That's what we're talking about with relative VO2. So in terms of the circumstances, we use them from a performance perspective. Other than just comparing athletes together, we use relative because it brings everyone back on a level playing field. But when we're talking about performance, which ones are better suited to different types of sports? Absolute VO2, because we're not concerned about body weight, we're just concerned about the raw output, typically is gonna be better for predicting performance or looking at performance in sports where body weight is absorbed by something else. So maybe that's flat cycling, time trialing, um, the cycle leg of most triathlons that have a flat course, swimming as well as a good example, rowing as well. All of these sports, something is absorbing the body weight uh, of the person. So from a bike perspective, the bike is absorbing that. It's about how much power you can push. Typically, you'll see the bigger, taller, um, more muscle mass on, on athletes. They're going to go faster on the bike on the flat. Different when we get uphill, and I'll get to that in a moment. But as well as swimming and rowing, we're talking about buoyancy in the water. So typically, we see those athletes, big shoulders, nice and tall, long levers. That's going to help them perform best in their sport. It's all about the total engine size because the body weight isn't really factored in. When we are looking at sports like running or even uphill cycling where body weight needs to be overcome to produce the movement, so we're talking about uphill cycling in particular where you're overcoming your body weight and gravity. Running, obviously, you have to carry your body weight every step. We're now looking at relative VO2 is a bit more of an indicator for us because we have to overcome that mass. We're looking at what is our what is our economy in these, in these aspects in terms of can we use a large amount of oxygen, but how effective are we using an oxygen for our size? ultimately telling us how efficient or economical that engine is overall as well. 
So they're the circumstances we use them, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things because some athletes do get confused when they look at their VO2 max and they might say, great, I had a really big improvement in VO2 max. Does that automatically mean I'm gonna be a better, faster athlete? Not always. And the reason being is because sometimes that can just come down to body weight. So I'll put up a, an example here. Let's have a look at the example of 60 mils per kilo per minute. We, it seems like a bit of a, a an undisclosed benchmark in endurance performance where athletes like to talk about 60 mils per kilo per minute as being a good a good starting point. And we look at that in the lab. If someone comes in uh, for a lab test, they do a VO2 max test, they hit 60 mils per kilo per minute as a relative VO2 max. We look at it and go, they've got a pretty good starting point. They're a pretty fit athlete. They must have done a bit of work to get to this point already. To make up 60 mils per kilo per minute, it could come from a number of different ways. We have a look at athlete A, 65 kilos. To achieve a relative of 60 mils per kilo per minute, they only need an absolute of 3,900 mils per minute. Some of these numbers might not make a lot of sense to you, but when I say they only need, 3,900 is pretty sort of typical of the average amateur athlete. So you can see how someone with a lighter mass doesn't really need to use a massive amount of oxygen. When we look at the really big athletes, someone like an Olympic rower, for example, or a, um, a really big tall cyclist, six foot six and 110 kilos, they might be using as an absolute, they might have 5,000, five and a half, maybe six and a half thousand, even as high as that absolute mils per minute. They're using massive amounts of oxygen, but they might weigh 110 kilos. So that's where their relative is sort of uh, not, maybe not quite as high as, as a smaller athlete who's got 3,900 absolute. On the flip side, another typical example might be a 75 kilo athlete. So we're only 10 kilos heavier, but you can see here to get 60 mils per kilo per minute, you need to be using 4,500 mils per minute as an absolute to achieve that same relative because you've got more body mass behind you. So this is a really, I guess, important factor in terms of understanding if your relative VO2 max goes up, you need to make sure that if we're looking at, is that a result of a training or a physiological improvement? We're looking at, does that, does that mean our absolutes change or is it just a byproduct of our um, our body mass reducing? Our fitness overall is relatively the, or pretty much the same. Our relative VO2 has come up because we are lighter mass. So something to keep in mind when we are looking at that. On the flip side though, losing a bit of mass might be an important fitness um, or but also a performance gainer for you. Athletes who can lose uh, some body weight, there's some benchmarks we like to look at in terms of some, some talk about for every kilogram we lose, particularly for runners, and we're talking about running economy here, even if we haven't gained oxygen consumption, we're not using any more oxygen, absolute, but we can get a performance benefit by being a little bit lighter because we're more economical. And this is where body weight change might be, might be a factor. We sometimes look at things like three seconds per kilo per K as a very general rough rule. It's not gonna work for everyone, but roughly three seconds per kilogram of body weight lost per kilometer of your event is roughly what you can gain by dropping some body weight. It's not the type of thing that by dropping one kilo, you're gonna notice that difference. Over a 5K event, by dropping one kilo, we're talking about may, maybe 15 seconds at most you could you could improve by. Typically, the, the faster you are and the leaner you are, the less of an impact that's actually gonna make anyway. Um, if we're looking at an athlete who is going from say a, a 20 minute 20 minute 5k, but they've dropped 10 kilos, of course they're gonna notice some significant difference. Maybe they might pick up 30 or 60, uh, 60 seconds as a result of body weight loss. It, it's not. It's it's a very general rule and it typically holds true for some of the long, longer events, half marathon, marathon, but it's something that dropping body weight and improving relative VO2 through that method can be something that can improve your performance, but it's not gonna have a significant effect as just getting fitter. And that's the absolute VO2 part. Have we changed the infrastructure through our body heart, lungs, muscles, to be able to take in, transport, and utilize oxygen any better. If not, our absolute isn't gonna change, therefore our VO2 max isn't gonna, relative VO2 max isn't gonna change unless we drop weight. If we drop weight, we might see a small improvement, but it's never gonna be as much as imp dramatically improving that absolute and boosting things up from that perspective. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea about the differences between relative and absolute VO2 max, what the two different numbers mean, the one on your watch is gonna be that relative one, so we see that quite a lot, but keeping in mind, we may not be seeing genuine change in that if there isn't anything changing your body weight or if, if we're sort of gaining body weight and you're improving your fitness, but body weight's going up, that's gonna mask a bit of the change too. Any questions about relative and absolute, please leave them in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts and, and ideas as well. Always happy to hear them. Continue to please subscribe to the channel. Really appreciate the support and a few of the messages that have come through over the last couple of weeks since I have been a little bit quiet. I really do appreciate the support um, and looking forward to getting a bit more bit more content out a little bit more regularly again after having a little bit of time off to, to get my body right and my injury stuff right. 
um, and getting through all these lockdowns and things like that through COVID in Melbourne here. So again, appreciate the support. Head over to Instagram, check out the great content over there at NJ underscore sports science in the bottom corner here. Otherwise, that is it for today and we'll see you in the next one.